Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Kingdom Come podcast, an OPCC original. You can find us on all audio platforms and videos on our YouTube channel, Overland Park Community Church. I'm Tyler Savatinaya, and I'm joined today by Grant Ford, another member of our church and leader here. Um, I've, I've learned a little bit about Grant here and not a ton, um, but I am excited to be able to bring him on to learn a little bit more on uh, why he's here and who he is. Yeah. Yeah. This is fun for me. So I'm the discipleship pastor here at OPCC, and that journey is pretty recent. I've only been here about eight months, but my journey started 20 or so years ago when, as I was growing up, very normal household. I had an older brother, my mom and dad, thankfully they were together. However, they believed vitally different things. My mom went to church. She took my brother and me to church, and I thought, well, that must be truth. However, when I'd come home on Sundays, my dad would say, that's nonsense. Don't believe that. <laughs> that's mythology. And so growing up as a six or seven-year-old, I was thinking, what in the world is truth? Who do I believe? Because I love these two people more than anyone, and yet they believe different things. So who should I trust? And that created in me a lot of confusion growing up. It left me with anxiety and fear because I started thinking, if I trust the wrong thing, where am I going to end up? Because again, according to each of them, very different places, very different trajectories for my life. How old were you at this time? I was probably eight, eight, seven oh. or eight is when this started happening. But it left, it burned in me. It kind of seared in me this confusion and this anxiety. And for a number of years, almost doubt was creeping in because I'd go to church on Sunday, but again, it would be in the back of my head. What's real? Is this true? Because everyone here says it is. But again, my dad, who I regarded very highly, said it wasn't. Now, as an eight-year-old or nine-year-old, I couldn't figure out why he was saying that. And as I got older, about 12 or 13, I really wanted to find out for myself, what is this truth? And I didn't want to listen to anybody because I just thought, oh, those are the, their opinions. And I opened up the word, and I had probably heard a lot of Bible stories growing up. I had heard sermons, but I had never, with my own volition, wanted to seek out, is Jesus real? Is what he says true? And so I opened the Bible, and thankfully I turned to the Gospel of Mark. And I remember as I first was reading it, I was blown away. It was a summer. I was at a camp. I was alone, and I was reading through the Gospel of Mark, and everything that I was reading was hitting my heart. And it came to a specific chapter, the second chapter of Mark, verse 17. Jesus is talking to people who are regarded as sinners, and it says, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that hit my heart. Because even when I was 12 or 13, there were things, plenty of things that I was doing and had done that left me full of shame, full of guilt, and even pressed upon that fear I was already feeling. And I realized, wow, I'm broken. But Jesus specifically came for people like me. And in that, as I continue reading the gospel, I was moved by Jesus. I was moved that by the end of the story, he willingly exchanges places with me. Whereas I should be on the cross because I sinned, he took my place. And honestly, I've, I just fell in love with Jesus and I wanted to love him and I wanted to trust him. And so I came home from that camp and I expressed these things to my mom, expressed these things to my older brother who was also a follower of Jesus. And through conversations and prayer solidified that decision to really want to put all my hope and faith in Jesus and what he did for me. And I remember I, I, I made that decision. I made that public profession and got baptized. And even that night, I recall lying in bed thinking, I have no idea what's going to happen in my life, but I know I'm going to be okay because of Jesus. And again, you, you, were, you said 18, 19 at this time? No, no. I, was, I was 13. You got to take a second and just like realize... 
how momentous that moment is. Mm -hmm. At 13 years old, to be able to make that decision and stand firm, there's, there's not, there's, I don't know of anyone who's able to really make the, those claims yeah. and an adult decision at that young of an age. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that reminds me of, um, I, I'm reminded most of the time by Eutychus mm. of a, like a younger, an early teens sort of phase mm -hmm. where you're upstairs and people are talking the real things of Jesus's life and what's to come. And like, yeah, you're feeling tired. Dude, dude's falling asleep, falling yeah. out of the window. Like I've had a little bit too much pizza. It's time to go to bed sort of thing. And you're sitting there joining the adults at such a young age and like really sitting upon the words of Jesus. That is. Yeah. Well, it's not so much of me. I mean, I was seeking Jesus, but he was seeking me. Right. And even though I was opening the book, he was the one speaking. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was all in the context and the backdrop, though, of my father saying this wasn't real. I think we probably, most of us, don't have the intentional pushback in our faith that young in life. And so because it was so real, it forced me to make a decision, I think earlier than maybe typically. And even after I made that decision when I was 13, I started being homeschooled by my father. And that's when he started sharing different philosophies, different religions. And he started asking me questions from scripture that I didn't know how to answer. And it left me in this moment of, as soon as I had given Jesus my faith and my heart, I started wrestling with doubt. Because now I have questions about the very thing I just gave my all to, and I can't answer. What do I do? And it was a very real moment for me. And I remember talking with my mom and she encouraged me and she said, you, e you either got to press on and keep believing or you stop believing, but don't be in this chasm where you're like, not sure. And I remember that night I said, Jesus, I'm going to choose to believe you, even though I don't know everything about you. And I don't know how to answer all these questions, but it led me to start looking at other people, other scholars and what they had written about Jesus, the his ferocity, uh, the, the historical facts around his life that he had lived, that we have people who, are, who aren't Christians but historians of that time writing about Jesus, writing about the very fact that he had a group of people who claimed to believe he had rose from the dead, and all these things surrounding his death and resurrection that I was just filled with faith, and I think it led me to establish a firmer foundation of that original faith. So I came out of that with a, a desire for truth and to tell people that truth. And so that led me into going on a mission trip. I was 16. I didn't want to go. I remember my mom was like, hey, we have this chance to go to Kenya for about three weeks. What do you think? And I flat out without hesitation said, no. I was like, I'm going to die if I go over to Africa. I'm going to get bit by a mosquito or something. <laughs> And I, I, I just told her no, but thankfully the Holy Spirit left that on my heart and I couldn't stop thinking about that opportunity. And I realized he was saying, you need to go. So I went and funny enough, I did almost die. That's a story for another time. But in that stretch of time in Kenya, I got to go to a Bible study, if you would call it that, but it's basically these people called the Turkana. And they were reading the book of Philippians for the first time in their own heart language. And I was, as I was sitting there, hearing them read their own language, but it was God's word, it just, it kicked me. It, it hit me right in the heart. And I felt like God said, this is what I've made you to do. You need to go take the gospel to people who have never heard my name. And so I came back from that trip and I, and I thought it was Bible translation. So I ended up for the rest of high school and into college taking all the courses I could on Greek, Hebrew, the original biblical languages, how does translation work, how to do church planning overseas. And I'm so glad that the Lord led me in that because it brought me here. Now, it wasn't Bible translation that I ended up doing because midway through that process in college, I started to take some of these difficult courses I was learning in Bible college this high theology, and started to implement it and make it practical. And I was encouraged by a discipleship pastor 
to really start living out my faith and really to start, you know, how do you spend time in God's word every day? And not reading it necessarily from the scholarly point of view, but how are you reading it because God is wanting to speak to you personally, intimately that day? And so I started doing that. I started growing in that. And then how are you sharing your faith? Who are you sharing your story with? Who are you sharing God's story with? And as I was being asked these questions, I said, well, one, I don't know how to do that. I need training. I need someone to show me. Even though I'm in Bible college, I can tell you how the gospel of Luke was written and the way it was put together. But you're wanting me to go share the gospel with some lost person. I'm not really comfortable or sure how to do that. So I grew in that. And in that, in that season of really making faith practical and hands-on, God said, this is really what I'm wanting you to move into. The Bible translation was an amazing process, and it shaped so much of me. But that is what I want you to do. Go overseas, take the gospel, and share it with people. So through a few different portions of this story, it, it a child, a young teenager, and now a young adult, you've given a couple different examples. Number one, self-identification. One of the things we talked about in an mm -hmm. earlier podcast how, how do you attribute to being able to have the ability to do mm. something that most adults can't do with or without a relationship in Jesus? Mm -hmm. how, how does somebody so young have that ability when 50, 70, mm -hmm. 45 year olds don't have the ability to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. I can't take any credit. <laughs> I had people in my life, this discipleship pastor, namely, who he had what I recognized was a real, authentic, genuine walk with Jesus. And that's what I wanted. I wanted it to grow. I wanted it to deepen. And the Lord just clearly highlighted, this is a guy you should learn from. And it was very much like an apprenticeship where I would spend time with him. He would teach me things. We'd practice it, and then he'd be like, all right, now go share that with others. And as we learned that little by little, it grew me. Um, but it was part of that process where self-identifying occurred. It wasn't because I necessarily thought that's what I should do, but I think it was something that was instilled in him, and he helped me recognize it. And would that be the same for the other portion that you're able to listen intently mm. and be able to look for what the Lord is doing in your life. Again, many adults aren't able to listen to other adults that are in the room, yeah. let alone be able to, to listen to the one who they can't see, mm. but is constantly speaking to them. What do you, uh, is it kind of the same way you're modeling your life after uh, this discipleship leader um, that you had, or is there something more to it? Well, I think it all stems from scripture where Jesus is talking about his own discipleship and he's talking about his role with the father. And he says, I only do what my father tells me to do. And I only say what my father tells me to say. And Jesus is modeling for his disciples, including us, our walk with him and that we would become such a people that listen to his voice and that he specifically wants to tell us day by day, moment by moment, this is how I'd like you to go. This is what I'd like you to say. Now, some of us may believe, no, that doesn't happen. But for those of us who do believe that, I think it makes every day and every moment extraordinary because you don't know what the Lord might say or ask you to do. But if you're open to it, the Holy Spirit will want to speak and cause you to do something. A lot of times that's outside of your comfort zone, but that's where he works. You can tell me if I'm using this word wrong, but the, the dichotomy between your story and also coming to the realization that Jesus is only doing what the Father tells him to do and and you and say what the Father tells him to say, but the um, issues you had at a young age between the mm -hmm. differential between your mother and father, the dich dichotomy of those stories between the two mm -hmm. is a, a wide chasm that can be very confusing for somebody at, such a young age, whether it's yourself or, or anybody else listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard to differentiate between the two, but, um, I mean, your ability to be able to listen and know what's truth coming from the Lord is just resound resounding. Well, again, I think it's, 
it's all of the Lord's credit. I mean, if there's nothing I could say to do, but when all of us read scripture, we have a decision. Is this what we believe is real? Or is this just some story? And if it's real, then what does that mean for me today? Did this just happen to a bunch of random guys 2,000 years ago or further back? Or is this same God still alive and active and wanting to speak and wanting to work? And if so, how do I join him in that? I think sometimes what I was taught, and again, none of this is, I didn't fall upon this. Men and women who have grown in the Lord and far surpassed me, these are just things I've that have trickled down, that have been learned and processed and took years to cultivate. However, I'm so glad. I'm so glad the Lord showed me those things. Leading further into that, though, listening to the Lord, I felt like he said, you need to go now. And I was married at the time, and thankfully my wife had that same call and push. We weren't sure where to go, but we knew he said go. And we ended up going to the first team of this missions organization we were a part of that had been asking for someone. They had been praying for someone for seven years, another teammate, to come and join them on the field. And so that took us to a very special place in China, Wuhan, which we probably all know and recognize now. We had no idea Wuhan even existed. But we moved over there in 2019 and got to see God do incredible things. However, in the midst of all that, we also saw God in 2020 bring us back home. And that left both my wife and I with a lot of questions. We felt like we had clearly heard the Lord say, go. And yet everything in our world came crashing down, like for a lot of people. But we had to be evacuated back, and we were staying with our parents for about six months, every month trying to get back into China because all of our stuff was there. We were still paying on an apartment. We, didn't, we could take one suitcase back on that evacuation flight. So we just didn't have a lot, and we were hoping, longing to return. And after a year, God clearly was telling us, you need to stay here and just invest where I have you. You know, it's, it's funny when you look at Matthew 28, the word go is not, it's not a command. It's actually in the aorist form of Greek, and it means as you are going, make disciples. It's evident that the Lord wants us to go, but in that passage in particular, the emphasis is that wherever you go all the time, be making disciples, not just with this trajectory to go in one specific place. And that's what the Lord had made clear. Hey, right now in Kansas City, where you're at, make disciples. And so we just started meeting with people who had an interest. They wanted to hear about what we were doing, what we had done overseas, and we wanted to multiply that. We wanted to equip and empower the average regular day person to hear from the Lord, just like we were hearing, and to be able to obey him and share him with the lost in their lives. And so that happened back in 2021. Fast forward a couple of years from that removal out of Wuhan, there was a lot of internal damage emotionally, spiritually, and mentally for me that I hadn't really dealt with. And I started seeing the ramifications of all that in 2022, where I noticed I stopped taking chances. I stopped doing things that maybe the average person would do. Like they would, they would want to go on some kind of hiking or camping trip. And I'd say no, because I was afraid because I couldn't control the outcome. And as I was going through the book of Revelation in 2022, God calls out people who are living in cowardice. And I was like, oh, God, that's me. That's my attitude and mentality. I'm a coward. And for the first time, I had actually labeled myself because the Spirit just made it abundantly clear that's the season and state you're living in right now where you're not living in this boldness and the freedom I've given you in Christ. But you're making choices based on whether or not you feel comfortable or that you can control the outcome. And that started affecting my marriage, started affecting my, my walk with the Lord, affected my parenting. I was so scared of my kids doing anything that could potentially hurt them. 
you know, they'd get some kind of scratch or broken bone, who knows. And that, that was not a good place to be in. But thankfully the Lord said, you need to repent. And it wasn't an action I necessarily needed to turn around, but it was a, it was a belief because I was believing that safety was my number one priority. And so I gave into cowardice. But the Lord was saying, no, you need to believe that I'm your Lord. Stop trying to be your own Lord. I'm good, is what he's saying. I'm sovereign. I'm almighty. Trust me. And that's been, that's been a hard walk. It's been hard to kind of walk out of this rut that I've been in. And the way the Lord has gotten me out of that is by putting me in spots where I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like I'm in control. But that's where he's wanting to refine me and make me more like Jesus. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful he has me here, but it's not fun. I'm not in a fun season <laughs> because I'm doing things I don't want to necessarily be doing where I'm uncomfortable and I can't control, but it's making me lean on him. It's making me trust him. And that's where, that's honestly the safest place is to be living in his will, trusting him. I'm reminded by in like each one of those pieces of the story, you're met with something that's out of your control, which most everything is out of our yeah. control, yeah. right? But you're met with something where you feel you're in control and then all of a sudden you're out of control. And the cool thing is, is when the Lord tells you to go mm. un, unchanged in anything, you go. Yeah. And I'm reminded by... Um, the story of Lot and his family is there mm. uh, being called to leave Sodom and Gomorrah and get out of there. And, and um, he, Lot and his family leave. And then all of a sudden his wife turns around to see the destruction and, and get one last glimpse of where, you know, their home is. Mm -hmm. And she's turned into a pillar of salt. Not one time did you look back. And now the, the, the amazing thing is, is even though God is wrathful, he's no longer, um, like it, there's no know, condemnation. There's in no Christ, condemnation right? in, in yeah. Christ. Like there is that change, and we are so grateful mm -hmm. for that. Is that we are allowed to to change mm -hmm. our ways at any time due to the grace that's been given to us. Yeah. And so while it's amazing that it, it's actually unbelievable how at every turn you're just saying, okay, I I can identify this is what the Lord is saying to me and now go and do it. A lot of others, including myself, have not been able to a, mm. at certain times. And, and, um, I think that's just like the perfect statement mm. of being able to, when you can identify, go mm -hmm. when you aren't learn to identify, but know that there will be no condemnation, condemnation. Yeah. That that's the beauty of, I mean, we could talk about the gospel all day, but one of the best things for me personally is that there's no condemnation, but there is healthy conviction, oh, right? Oh, of course. And I think that's the difference where, and that's the the trap sometimes the enemy wants us in, is he wants us to be condemned and feel condemned and feel guilty about things. Whereas the Holy Spirit lovingly convicts and he shows us where we're wrong and he pushes us gently to where we where we need to go. And that's what the Spirit's been doing. I think... Alluding to your story that we well, we've been able to listen to last last podcast was the fact that in your own life you recognized there were some habits when you were listening to the Lord and when you were doing that how how much faith and trust you had in Him and in the seasons where you weren't like myself that's when we're kind of in this space of, space of chaos not sure where to go where to turn and we feel tired and we feel uh, removed from everything good that the Lord had planned. But when we center back into him, when we listen to his voice, it's, he's good, he's calm, he's loving. That's where I want to be. And, and I think that's where we all want to be. But it is, we do have to learn those habits. We have to learn the practicality of how do we listen to his voice? And when we hear his voice, what should we do about it? That's a good word, man. Thank you for sharing your story. I, I think my pleasure. Not only if I, if nobody else learned anything from it, I most certainly did, and it's cool to come to the realization that, like through two two stories already, listening to the Lord can change 
everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely. No matter, no matter like what you're thinking or resonating with, you have to stop. You have to turn. You have to listen. And when we do that, mm-hmm. we will become happier in whatever is meant to happen because we're not in control. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, if this is the first time you are hearing of the Lord, mm-hmm. you don't know the Lord, maybe you feel called to speak to someone, we're here for you. This is what we're doing in, in building a community and sharing the stories of what is happening in our community. We mm-hmm. want to hear what's happening in yours. So if you need somebody to speak with, reach out to us, most specifically Grant. You can reach him here at his email, grant at overlandpark.cc. We would love to hear how the Lord is working in your life and in the communities around you. So please also share this podcast or video if you're watching with your friends and your family and help us create the community that can continue to glorify the Lord and share in his word. Mm -hmm. Make sure you come back next week to hear more stories on how the Lord is moving. And as always, have a blessed week.